you you make you made a good point there about intoxication because a lot of the patients we work with they say I want the medical portion of cannabis, not the recreational portion. And when they say that, they look at THC being the recreational portion, CBD and other cannabinoids being the, the non-psychoactive, the medical portion. Right. And they all play a role. And I always use you, we're in California, you know, you and I can go wine tasting. We take little sips here, feeling great. We drink three bottles of wine. We're going to be intoxicated. And the same thing with THC. You can have success with one milligram, two milligram, uh, uh, doses of THC combined with um, other cannabinoids as well. Welcome to Be Informed, Be Well with John Malaka. Hey everybody, John Malaka here with United Patient Group, Be Informed and Be Well. And I'm here with friend and colleague, Dr. Jordan Tischler. How are you doing, Doc? I am well, thank you. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be on the show with you. Oh, 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 oh you know, we do it. We do a lot together. So it's, I, I seem like I, I talk to you uh, more than anybody in this industry. <laughs> so, so, yeah. You know what? I think so too. And that's yeah. just fine with me. Cool, cool, cool. So um, what we're going to discuss, you know, here at United Page Group, we receive a lot of calls. Our demographic, you know, is pretty much 40 to to. 140. And so, but we have a lot of elderly that trust us saying, help, where do we go? What do we do? You know, does this work for that? Does it work for this? And, you know, I'm the first to say cannabis is not a one size fits all. I truly believe we're not 20 anymore. And I truly believe that a medical professional should be involved. Um, what I'm seeing, not only in with my mom, you know, my dad passed away a few years ago and my mom's 85 and still very active, but I'm seeing some anxiety come in. I always shared her. I said, mom, you're not old. Get that out of your mindset. She goes, God, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Re reminding me about that because, you know, she's very active and if I, and I'm very fortunate that if she wanted to go visit my brother down in Santa Barbara, she can drive by herself and I'd feel hundred percent confident, you know, and uh, she has some other friends that even driving to driving to churches is, is <laughs> brings on a lot of anxiety, not Absolutely. only for them, but for my mom, if my mom's driving with them. So, but, um, <laughs> let, you know, and you, you being a, an MD and specializing not only with patients of all ages, shapes and size, but you work with a lot with the elderly. And that's why I wanted to have you on. I'm going to go right to the question here is um, what causes anxiety in the elderly? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I think that that's the million dollar question or maybe yeah. it's a billion dollar question with inflation. Um, yeah. I, the, the reason I, I don't mean to stump you on the reason I say that is because what I'm seeing and I'll, I'll use my mom and her friends as an example, memory problems, you know, they're forgetful. Oh my God, I forgot about that. Or I have to do this, or I'm worrying about, I did the mail come today. My mom, <laughs> you know, don't worry about the mail. On the mail. So oh, yeah. those are the types of things that come up. And I even think with COVID, I'm seeing more and more with uh, her and her girlfriends like that. And so that that's why I asked you that question. Is, is it I, something I that causes, is it losing a spouse and knowing, okay, you know, everyone's going on with their lives and now all of those things yeah. is the problem. And, and, and sort of to your point about one size doesn't fit all. I think that, you know, the reasons any one individual might have anxiety are going yeah. to be partially aging and partially individual issues. You know, as we age, we tend to um, perhaps have some greater memory issues, other uh, cognitive issues, not just memory come into play, but also, you know, things like the world is moving quickly. And at some point we seem to be less interested in keeping up. So, you know, I think that in every generation, there comes a point in technology where it's no longer of interest to keep up and then you feel befuddled. And when my grandparents were older, the issue was that they couldn't figure out the remote for their television, right? Um, which now seems I, like- I still receive those calls. Right. John, what do you do? I go, mom, just hit- reboot or do this she's oh my god what would i do what would i do without you so it's almost a decrease in like an ability to perform, perform daily activities can you you know i feel i can't reach up i, I you know i don't want her climbing on a, on a uh, ladder you know it's stuff I, like that it's like ah i've been so active and independent my whole life you but know then there's, there's also the fact that as we age we tend to get less sleep and less quality sleep yeah um 
And that impacts our daytime alertness and our feelings of competence. And in fact, may in fact our affect our actual competence. Um, so there are a lot of factors that are going on. And then I think we also probably have to address the elephant in the room, which is that, you know, none of us, as my father would have said, escape life alive. Um, and, but as you get older, you, that comes into sharper and sharper focus. You know, yeah. I have a 19 year old daughter and thankfully God, God willing, she doesn't think about this at all. Um, and, you know, here I am at, at the ripe old age of 55 and I don't sleep that well because I wake up in the middle of the night. I'm thinking about how much I miss my father who died a little over a year ago and how I need to take care of my mom who's 83 and she's doing well, but she's still 83, you know. And, and so, you know, you get into this place where now you're the middle generation and you start to have some anxiety and then you get to be the older generation. And I, I, I personally think I'm going to be tearing my hair out with anxiety. Um, so I, I'm very sympathetic. I, I'm right behind you on, on age, but also with sleep. And I truly believe sleep is like a domino effect. If you miss this piece, the domino effect happens uh, with anxiety, uh, maybe depression, you know, uh, pain. Pain. you're and eating. Pain. Right. Well, and that, you, all of these things are connected. Yeah. Pain leads to anxiety, leads pain. to poor sleep. Poor sleep leads to anxiety, leads to little pains seeming like bigger pains. I mean, they're all connected into this horrible ball of wax. So let, let's talk about cannabis and anxiety. And I know, um, can you still hear me? Because I know my, yep. my thing popped up, the internet connection was a little slow, sorry. Um, but let's talk about cannabis, cannabis not and, and elderly, cannabis not being a one size fits all. And it's becoming a... A household conversation, not only around my, with my mom and her girlfriends, also at church, the bridge, their flower, you know, uh, uh, clubs or whatever, you know, garden clubs, you know, and she says, it, it, everyone's talking about it. And now knowing that I'm in the industry, I get a lot of questions about yeah. this. John, does it work with this? Does it work with that? And I'm, many of you have heard on my show before that I still receive calls from friends from high school and they say, man, <laughs> my mom listened to you and I want to thank you. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, we've been trying to tell mom for this, but sometimes it takes an outside person to have that discussion. And you know what? She's sleeping better. She's doing this. She's off her medications or she's, she's titrated off, off of these. Or, and uh, can you talk about that? You being an MD and what you see with your patients and what you recommend uh, to your patients, not only to have a conversation with a doctor, and feel comfortable and confident doing so, but also a conversation with your family. So they don't look at you like, what are you doing, mom? You know, <laughs> I think thankfully for most older folks, the younger family members are attuned enough that they're not so much the issue as the older person's fear that, yeah. the, that the younger people will look at them funny, but that a conversation actually seems to generally go pretty well. And that many of my older patients are actually sort of um, prodded by, by their children or grandchildren into coming to me. And ultimately, I think that that's a good thing too. You know, I, I think it's important that we view this as a medication. And so we don't want to dabble with it. There are a lot of ways that we can do this that are not ideal. Um, and there are a few ways that are sort of the best practices. I think everybody should be talking about these issues with their doctors. Um, and then I know that a lot of people, particularly older folks, are concerned that their doctors will say, you know, oh, tisk tisk, this isn't medicine, it's bad for you, that sort of thing. My best advice is have that conversation anyway. You may be surprised that your doctor is much more open-minded than you think. And if they come at you with all of that sort of baloney, then it's time to think about finding somebody else who can help you. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to leave their practice completely, but rather you need to find somebody like a specialist like myself who's not only open-minded, but has a lot of experience with this sort of thing so that we can get you to where you need to be. Where would they start with cannabis with you? I mean, what would you recommend? You know, if a, a first time, a lot, a lot of these, uh, I'll say patients and, and the, the elderly demographic that we work with on a regular basis, they say, John, I've never tried cannabis. You know, my mom was a perfect example. You know, she's never tried it. 
And I remember one time she, you know, I just always say good morning, good night, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good night to her. And I remember she, Corinne and I spoke, spoke, called her one night to say good night. And mom said, I have to ask you, and all, now by this point, all her girlfriends had been coming to us and, you know, and getting some information. And mom said, can I ask you something? I said, yeah. She says, does cannabis help with sleep and pain because she's an ex tennis player as well? And she goes, my shoulder doesn't hurt. And I've been taking a little cannabis every night to go to sleep. And I was silent and Corinne hits me. She's like, be supportive, be supportive. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, that's the last thing I thought my mom would. And I said, yeah, she's like, it's amazing. She goes, you know, after your father passed, I may have looked to this for help with sleep uh, as well. And um, to hear my mom say that, you know, it's funny. And I didn't share that with my brother for about three or four months. And he came to me, he's like, you know, mom's doing this. I said, yeah. He said, why didn't you tell me? I said, well, <laughs> if she, well, if she wanted to tell you, she would have right? told you. For a patient like my mom or anyone that's listening right now, you know, their question is, Dr. Tischer, where do I start? And I think that that's exactly the right question. And the answer to it depends a little bit on what's going on. Uh, so I don't certainly mean to be being vague about this, but for example, if somebody comes to me and they say, doc, I'm just having some anxiety, then I might turn to um, cannabis by inhalation. And when I say inhalation, what I mean is uh, using a, sorry, hang on a sec, uh, a, a flower vaporizing machine like this one. Uh, which avoids the whole smoking thing because smoking isn't very good for us, number one. And I think rightfully, most older people are loath to go in that direction. But that doesn't necessarily mean that inhalation is an inappropriate approach. Inhalation is rapid in its onset, relatively short in its duration of action. And this allows us to sort of be very precise and surgical in our approach to the anxiety. And this is one of the things where the cannabis industry and cannabis users really get things wrong. Um, if you ask some of our stoner friends how you treat anxiety, the response you'll get is, well, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is smoke up some weed. And anytime you feel anxious, you just continue to smoke. And we know that that's not the right answer. We know that that actually can uh, negatively impact school and work performance, and it can actually make anxiety worse. And you can get into this catch-22 where you use cannabis for anxiety and it provokes anxiety. So you use more cannabis, you get worse anxiety. We don't want that. That's, a, that's completely the wrong direction. However, a small low dose given around bedtime is ideal because it will wear off while you're asleep. The intoxication part will wear off, but it's not the intoxication that is fundamentally helpful for the anxiety. It is some other effect of the cannabis that, that is helpful. And the intoxication is sort of a side effect that we get in, in the process. So we don't need that intoxication throughout the day what we need is a little dose at bedtime, and then that lasts throughout the day, even though we're no longer intoxicated. You know, you make you made a good point there about intoxication because a lot of the patients we work with, they say, "I want the medical portion of cannabis, not the recreational portion." And when they say that, they look at THC being the recreational portion, CBD, and other cannabinoids being the, the non psychoactive, the medical portion, right. and they all play a role. And I always use to we're in California, you know, you and I can go wine tasting. We take little sips here feeling great. We drink three bottles of wine. We're going to be intoxicated. And the same thing with THC, you can have success with one milligram, two milligram uh, uh, doses of THC combined with um, other cannabinoids as well. Um, what I'm finding and correct me if I'm wrong, you being a medical doctor, a lot of the seniors that we work with prefer a tincture or uh, an edible, anything from a piece of popcorn, a peanut or a gummy, because they're used to taking a one pill, you know, they can take one, one. And so, uh, and I know a lot of medical professionals perf don't really recommend the thing is you're eating sugar and doing that way, you know, uh, you know, so there are so many questions embedded in that. Let me try to take yeah. a swing at a few of them. The first is, yeah, I mean, I don't recommend that people go out and get uh, a bunch of brownies or a bunch of Rice Krispie treats because that's just more food 
and sugar than we need. But a little tiny gummy has almost no sugar in it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's that's a better approach to the whole food calories side of things. Yeah, I think that, you know, when we're talking about anxiety, uh, the edibles can be used, but they're a little tricky because, as you know, they have a delayed onset and a longer time of action. So for many people, it's actually easier to use the inhalation in the safe uh, approach compared with the edibles, even though we, you're right, people think an edible is, you know, a little gummy is kind of more akin to taking a pill. Um, it's, it's easier to take, but it's harder to time appropriately. Um, and the, and the inhalation is kind of the opposite, which is it's, you have to kind of get used to the, to the mechanics of it. But once you do, it's much more precise about what it's going to do when it's going to do it. So in some ways for anxiety, it's perfectly okay for us to sort of use either or. On the other hand, because of the ways they're different, there are other conditions that may go along with the anxiety where we need to pick one or the other. And a fine example of that would be insomnia. If somebody has anxiety and trouble getting to sleep, then we really do want to use the inhaled stuff because it's going to work before they need to go to sleep. If they are the kind of person who has anxiety and they wake up early in the morning and can't get back to sleep, then the edible is better because it has that longer duration and helps keep them asleep. And then if we're throwing pain management into that mixture, then uh, then the edibles tend to be better in general, but not all the time. So again, to your not one size doesn't fit all, you know, we have to kind of see what the total picture is here and then hone in. But I tend to tell my patients, we want to use cannabis by the means that's going to be most effective rather than sort of picking, you know, the thing that's sort of most familiar to us. You know, even with the doctor involved, which I, I, I cannot express enough how, how important that is having a doctor involved because cannabis is not a one size fits all. Um, I always say age, weight, current health condition, sensitivities, what you've eaten, um, what you're trying to trying to treat, but also, and also drug to drug interaction should be just because you're a senior male, you know, 85 ex experiencing anxiety doesn't mean that your buddy Tom over here, senior male 85 is they have the exact same dose as you. Um, two things. One, I want to talk about safety, but also finding that sweet spot. You know, my mom, you know, has found her sweet spot over the years of knowing exactly. And she takes it about 45 minutes before she gets in bed, takes it, brushes her teeth, gets ready to bed, boom. And, she, you know, slowly just falls asleep and wakes up. No hangover, no nothing like that, which a lot oh, of people. That sounds think. ideal. And so she has found what her perfect sweet spot is when she takes it and how long it takes. And then just kind of, kind of do dozes off back to safety because my mom lives alone. Uh, of course, now my father had passed away and a lot of seniors I work with, unfortunately, um, you know, are, are in the same boat being a widow. Um, and so that's the one thing I always talk about is safety first. Have you tried cannabis before? Yes. No. Do you live by yourself? Yes. No. Um, and can you share some of the safety precautions just in case if you take too much or if you live alone and this is the first time you're, you're uh, trying to treat anxiety or sleep or anything? Well, so a couple of things. The first is that many of my patients come with no previous cannabis experience or, yeah, you know, back in the 60s or the 70s, I did a little, but, you know, it was a long time ago. Um, so I try to kind of explain to them in terms that are familiar what kind what level of intoxication or fuzzy head we're expecting and I usually say look it's somewhere between half a glass and a glass of wine and I think people can relate to that that you know that's enough of a range that the people who get pretty tipsy on half a glass understand and the people who actually drink a full glass of wine understand but the point is that it's maybe a little tipsy, maybe a little fuzzy, but we're not expecting sort of drooling on the on our feet or locked in the couch or any of those horrible expressions that people use. So what we're what we're aiming for is very small doses with very minimal, uh, you know, side effects. 
So I think that that's hugely important. Um, I often encourage people to try it the first time with people around, call up their son, you know, have them come over for dinner, and then we can try the stuff out, that sort of thing. Um, but generally speaking, I also, you know, I don't, I don't worry about it too much. One of the good things is what you all know is cannabis cannot kill you. Um, so we really only need to worry about not getting too much in the sense that it can make us uncomfortable. Um, you mentioned a few paragraphs ago uh, that people like tinctures, and I'm actually, generally speaking, not a fan of tinctures. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is because it's a liquid. And as a liquid, it's very easy to make a mistake with the dose. And the dose okay. is the crucial element. And then on top of that, at the dispensary, they tell you stupid things like drip it into your mouth and put it under your tongue. And none of that turns out to be uh, true or a particularly good way of making sure you know how much you're getting. So when I do use a tincture, I have people drop it onto a spoon and then swallow it like a cough medicine. But in general, I don't do that. I, I, I favor those little gummies because you know what? If each gummy has five milligrams in it, you either took it or you didn't take it, right? I mean, there's like not a lot of in between. And I think that helps with not making mistakes. Measurements on the, the, the dropper, the, the actual dropper itself. Yeah, uh, those are woefully inaccurate. Okay. So, um, it, it, and it's tough too, also because um, a lot of cannabis companies don't know scientific standards. So it turns out that there is a standard that it, from a dropper, 20 drops should equal one ml, but you can find cannabis products out there that are used 20 drops per ml or 30 drops per ml or who knows what. So again, you have to kind of really be a little cautious that between the industry not knowing what they're doing and the patient being new to this, that you have to kind of spell it out carefully. You, you, you just brought up a point here, cannabis products. I'm confused. You're confused. We're in this industry and it's confusing on how many products are out there, what to believe, what to trust, what to look out for. And so uh, for a first time patient, doesn't matter if you're 20 year old or 120 years old, going into a dispensary for the first time uh, is quite confusing because you have just a, a wide variety of things. Can you share, you spoke about dosing. Can you talk about what you're generally seeing a safe dose is and or what type of cannabinoid are you recommending uh, for your patients THC versus CBD? I know CBD, you go anywhere from CVS to Walmart to your local gas station and pick up a CBD product uh, these days. And it's frustrating because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. And, and I get that quite a bit. Well, I just bought this over here. I bought it here. No, I mean, there's some great companies out there. So please, if you need, have any uh, questions, you know, contact Dr. Tischler or, or myself, and we can direct you to some reputable companies and what, or, and, or what to look out for. One is a tested USDA certified. I'm a big fan of organic. I'm a big fan of, but make sure number one thing is it tested as well. But can we talk about um, dosing as you've mentioned a couple of times, but also in your definition of dosing, is it dosing? What, can, what cannabinoid? THC, CBD, CBN, CBG? So, you know, I, I tend to follow the data. We've got 70 years worth of great data on THC being useful for pain management, anxiety, sleep, that sort of thing. Um, so I tend to focus on low doses of THC, understanding that one of the things that makes cannabis different from, from the pharmaceutical THC is that we're getting a range of chemicals along with the THC, even if we're only measuring the THC portion. Um, I have patients who are doing well, sort of on average between five and 10 milligrams of THC. Some of them need a little bit higher, 15, 20, very few above 20 and very few below five. So really five to 20 is kind of the ideal range uh, either once or twice a day, depending on what we're treating. Um, and, you know, I should say that even when we're using this by inhalation, there are ways that we can be very precise about the dose uh, so that we know that people are getting five or 10 or whatever milligrams of the THC. And that works out really well. And that's important because that allows us then if things need to be adjusted to know what was being done and how much you were getting. And it's not just kind of like, okay, 
take some more. You know, we can be very specific about it and we can also be very cognizant of where that safety range is. Um, one of the things you would want to talk about about safety is the other cannabinoids. Um, I would say to anybody listening, that you should not buy any cannabinoid or cannabis related uh, product at this time in any state of the United States without it's coming through a state regulated uh, medical cannabis program. And the reason for that is that there are companies out there that are manufacturing CBD products, they're manufacturing Delta 8 THC products or Delta 10 CHC products. There's a you know, if you're a chemist, you can take CBD from hemp and manufacture it into all the manner of things. Are you still there? Yes, you're still there. Yep. Um, and the problem is, it turns out that the process of changing CBD into other cannabinoids requires some very sophisticated chemistry because it uses some very dangerous chemicals and it can produce multiple outcomes, meaning if you want Delta eight and you start with CBD, you're going to get some Delta eight and you're going to get some other stuff that are related to, but not Delta eight. And many of these things are not easily detected by the testing that you're talking about. Um, and as a result, those contaminants persist throughout the process and actually make it to the shelf. Um, one of our uh, Association of Cannabinoid Specialist members uh, and I wrote a paper on this, which hopefully will get published in the next few months. Um, and it, it was really fascinating for me to go through all of this information with him because basically it comes down to a whole lot of really bad news that even the manufacturers aren't aware of yet. And so we need better testing and we need more regulation to enforce the better testing. So for the moment, um, you know, when you go down to the Whole Foods or the corner gas station to get some CBD, I think there's a high likelihood of that being contaminated with one thing or another that we really don't want to expose ourselves to. So just so we don't scare our audience that, that are <laughs> completely newbies, you know, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And, and uh, we're here for that. If you have any Absolutely. questions or any products that you may have been uh, referred to or recommended by a, one of your friends, uh, you know, but ask questions, make sure it's tested. And um, I'm a fan of US grown, if you can find a USDA certified, but uh, ask questions. And I'm a fan of starting, starting low, start low, go slow. I you know, I like the expression start low and go slow. And I think yeah. that it's unarguable, but the problem is that it doesn't give people really enough guideposts. Gotcha. What, what is low and where is the upper limit after I've been going slowly? And I think those are exactly the kinds of things that I address with patients so that, you know, we can say, all right, we're going to start at five milligrams. Oh no, you have some um, sensitivities. All right, we're going to start at two and a half milligrams. And we're going to advance over such and such a period of time. We're going to communicate back and forth through the process so that your questions are answered and any adjustments that we need to make, we make together in a thoughtful manner, but also that we don't end up, you know, at 50 milligrams, which is just way too much. And, you know, the, the, start low and go slow over enough period of time. And I've seen people end up at very high doses because we didn't say, uh, you know, if you get to X milligrams, stop and give me a call. So, you know, whenever I give somebody a prescription and I, I do write this out for people, it says something like five to 10 milligrams. And then I have an instruction sheet that says, start this way using five milligrams, do it for this long at this time, and then if things are going well, keep doing it. If things are not going, uh, if it's not being effective, then go to 10 milligrams and do that for a while. And then let me know, right? So that there's always this kind of connecting the dots again. Um, and, uh, and what we really don't want is people to say, oh, you know, I'm just going to go slowly, but I'm going to keep going. And then pretty soon, you know, there are 100 milligrams. Or something like that. Yeah. yeah. One, one thing, uh, another colleague of ours in the industry says is, Take a body check first. Take a deep breath and see where you are on a scale of one to ten. If it's if if you if you're having anxiety, use your cannabis. Wait for it to kick in, however long that may be. If it's if, depending on how you're uh, ingesting via inhalation or an edible, 
And after you feel that, take another deep breath and just take another body check to see where your anxiety is on a scale of one, one to 10. Is it still at 10 or is it down to two? And I'm a big fan of journaling. Write down what you've taken so you know exactly where, where you are in that sweet spot. Before we finish up here, can you talk about the dangers of pharmaceuticals and drug to drug interactions? Absolutely. Um, well, for one thing, I want to say that, you know, as a doctor, I don't have any particular fears of pharmaceuticals. Uh, I think that pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, do great things for us in general, if they're used wisely and appropriately. And it's unfortunate to me that, that many people have gotten shy of them. Um, and also particularly in this field where people, um, are, uh, are looking at cannabis, it's sort of like, you know, uh, uh, cannabis is a substitute for, you know, or I want to get away from the pharmaceutical, so I want to go to cannabis. To me, it's all medicine, right? And so they all come with benefits and they all come with risks. And we, our job is to use them wisely to maximize uh, the benefit, and minimize those risks. Um, however, to your point, there are certain cannabinoids, and in particular CBD, which as we've talked about is kind of everywhere at the moment, um, that through the way that they're processed through your liver can interact with many conventional medications that are also processed through the liver. And so, you know, there's sort of only so much that the liver can do at one time. And so if we have a pharmaceutical, which is doing fine on its own, but if it's too much or too little can be risky, and then we add CBD into the mix, then we may actually start to affect the level of the pharmaceutical medicine without thinking about it, because we're only thinking about the CBD. Um, and so we've seen this, and there are a bunch of medicines that are sort of, you know, fairly dangerous unless they're used carefully where this can interact. So um, amiodarone, which is a common heart medication, warfarin, which is a blood thinner, uh, Plavix, a different kind of blood thinner, um, the, the bunch of immunosuppressant medicines that people who have had organ transplants would be on, all, all interact with CBD. And if you're not thinking about it or you're not talking to your doctor about the CBD, then we can get into significant uh, risk. The one that has me most concerned at the moment is good old Claritin, loratadine, right? That's freely available over the counter across the country, and that's just fine. But if you overdose on loratadine, you can actually cause fatal heart rhythms, wow. right? So we only give 10 milligram tablets and that works fine for most people. Put CBD with that and suddenly that 10 milligrams is no longer 10 milligrams. Functionally, it's much higher. And I think that there's a, a, a significant risk that this is going to happen to people. Perfect. Again, the reason why I say a doctor should be involved, you know, going over uh, your what you're currently taking and what your uh, potential outcome is, what you would like to get from using cannabis. As, a, as you and I are both the fans of the, the, uh, the benefits of this miraculous plant, I also a lot of times direct people away from cannabis. And I'm a big fan of for anxiety, uh, which I do for my personal <laughs> anxiety is, but even, even breathing, taking deep breath, in your nose, out, do that five, 10, 15 times, and you'll be surprised to see how your anxiety will drop down. If you're able to move and walk out in the garden, work in the garden, get outside, get some vitamin D, get some fresh air. Um, and I don't care what age you are, getting outside for five minutes or, or an hour is, is really important. And even stretching, if you're able to stretch, you know, a lot of these elderly uh, communities have some um, yoga, but sit down yoga where you're in a chair and you can stretch. And I think or it's tai great chi. to, to get been demonstrated. Tai Chi, I, I do Tai Chi, did it this morning. And I just find that that, that uh, lowers my anxiety level down as well. But anyway, Dr. Tischer, always a pleasure uh, working with you as we do on a daily basis. But right. uh, can you share with uh, my audience um, how they can find you? Oh, yes, absolutely. So my clinic is called Inhale MD. And so you can go on over on the web to inhalemd.com 
and you can reach me through the website. But also I wanna point out that we have over 200 articles written for normal people, um, not doctors, but normal people on a very wide range of these topics that about cannabis, the benefits, the risks, uh, and there's a search bar. So if you want to put in something specific, you can find exactly the right article. So again, inhalemd.com. And, uh, and the phone number is there as well. We welcome phone calls and emails, anything that will help. I'll, I'll put it down in, 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 the, uh, in the description as well. So oh, that'd be awesome. Everyone, thank you very much for, for being with us here. And Dr. Tischler, always great being with you as well. Likewise. And we'll see you soon. John Malanka with the United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Be Informed, Be Well with John Malanka. Be Informed, Be Well is brought to you by United Patients Group. Come and visit us at unitedpatientsgroup.com. And thanks for listening.